Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 33. Jeremiah was the final prophet before the destruction of Jerusalem. He was an eyewitness to it. And he also got to prophesy of its destruction. But he also got to prophesy wonderful words of restoration, which we see in our passage here this morning. Thus says the Lord, in this place where you say it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place that is a waste without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting with their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hand of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause the righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon for this morning comes from our Old Testament lesson, Jeremiah 33, specifically verses 14 through 16. I've entitled it, Signs Your Redemption is Near. All right, 
Here we are, 1st of December. Sing with me. It's Everywhere you go. Want to keep singing? No, please, no. We know the song. I mean, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it on the radio along with all those other Rudolph Red-Nosed Reindeer, all those other classics that we love to hate. My point here is that the song is about talking about how when you see the signs that Christmas is coming, the snow and the tree and the decorations is supposed to raise our spirits, doesn't it? Does it really? I mean, think about it. December 1st, we got snow on the ground, it's cold, it's slippery, the malls are filled, you ain't too much on Thanksgiving, so your waistline is increasing while your wallet, the money in there is decreasing from all the shopping you have to do and the malls that are filled. Not exactly signs of fun, is it? Not exactly things that inspire what we're supposed to feel on Christmas. <laughs> That's kind of the way signs are. Depending on your point of view. Now, if you think about it, all of this struggle that we have to go through to prepare for Christmas makes, well, Christmas that much enjoyable when it comes. Except for maybe if this year you're celebrating Christmas without a loved one there. Then it's hard. In our gospel reading, we have signs that are pointing to Christ's return. <laughs> and he says, this is how we should view them. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Remember what those things were? Those things that were going to happen? Before our gospel reading, and we talked about them last Sunday, Wars and rumors of wars, disease, famine, natural disasters, people being called and punished for their faith. All of those things are these signs that are going to happen. And then Jesus says this, there'll be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the earth and the stress of the nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Not exactly signs that bring joy and, 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 and calmness to our heart, is it? I mean, you understand what Jesus is talking about here? He's talking about things happening that are beyond our ability to understand. We understand the tumult of the waves and the sea. We understand that happening in a hurricane and one location, but all over the world, the powers of the heaven being shaken. Why does the sun and the moon and the stars stay where they're at? Why does the earth rotate around the sun? Well, you can give me a physics answer, but basically God keeps everything where it belongs in this universe. There's a cohesiveness. When Jesus is about to return, that cohesiveness of the entire universe will fade away. None of the heavenly bodies staying where they're supposed to be, but free-falling and doing whatever. It's a sign of the end. It's the sign of something that Isaiah talks about, the sky being rolled up like a scroll, the mountains vanishing. Basically, everything that you know of as reality, out in the universe, and here on this earth, gone. Everything God you can understand why the people of the world will be in perplexity and in fear and feel foreboding. But Jesus says when these things take place, how should we react? <laughs> Not crouching down with fear. Stand up straight. Raise up your heads. Why? Because your redemption is drawing near. Same signs. Signs that bring foreboding to the world. For us, we're supposed to have a different outlook. 
a different point of view. We have to see all these things happening through the eyes of faith. This is really what's being talked about in Jeremiah's message in our Old Testament lesson. He's talking about the fulfillment of promises. As I said, Jeremiah was the last Old Testament prophet before the destruction of Jerusalem. He had to prophesy a lot of negative stuff. Destruction. Prophets before him, even Isaiah, talked about the fact that there would be a nation that would come that would destroy Jerusalem and Judah. But there was always a glimmer of hope. Isaiah was able to say, if you change and turn back to the Lord. Because that was the problem. The people had stopped worshiping God alone. They had worshiped all the Canaanite idols. And not just in their homes. They had set up temples and idols in Jerusalem itself, in the temple itself. By the same time Jeremiah came along, it had been too late. God was saying, it's going to happen. There's no way around it. Jeremiah prophesied before our reading that basically the entire promised land, the land of Canaan, that beautiful land that God had given his people, would be nothing but a wasteland. The result of Assyria coming beforehand and destroying the northern kingdom, and then Babylon rolling through, destroying everything in its wake, knocking down cities, killing people, taking them away, (coughs) killing flocks and herds, And now here they were, laying siege to Jerusalem. That's the setting for Jeremiah in our reading. Babylon has come and set up siege works against the city. But right before this reading that we have from him, something happened. Babylon took off. They left all their siege works there, but they took off. Why? Because Egypt had come marching up north. Egypt was the other big superpower. Egypt didn't want this new superpower, Babylon, that close to them. So their intention was to chase Babylon away so that they could control the land and Judah and Jerusalem for themselves. The people had kind of been, of Jerusalem, had been kind of cozying up to Egypt. They thought, aha, here we go. Babylon's going to take off. They won't be back. We're saved. Jeremiah said, nope. Think again. They're going to be back. And when they come back, they're going to go back at the city walls. They're going to knock them down, something that the people in Jerusalem didn't think would ever happen. They're going to invade. They're going to slaughter. They're going to leave dead bodies everywhere. And the rest that are surviving are to be gone and taken into exile. And the entire land of Judah is going to be left as a ghost town, a wasteland. Of course, this wasn't a popular message, you think? Nobody wanted to hear this, especially the king, King Zedekiah. Because Jeremiah had a special prophecy for him. You, King Zedekiah, because you went against Babylon and didn't come up underneath their rule like God told you to, you're going to be captured and you're going to have to stand before King Nebuchadnezzar and be taken into exile. For that, Zedekiah said, throw him in prison. And so Jeremiah, in our lesson, is preaching and teaching from the courtyard of the palace guard under house arrest. Everything that he, pre- he preached about, he got to see come true. Babylon did return. They did knock the walls down. They slaughtered and killed. They burned the city with fire, destroyed everything, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls. King Zedekiah tried to escape out through a hole in the back of the, uh, uh, of the wall. Babylonian army caught up with him. Nebuchadnezzar at this time wasn't right there in Jerusalem. He was a little ways north, governing what was happening throughout all of the promised land. Zedekiah was brought before him. Zedekiah got to see his advisors and then his family all beheaded. And that was the last thing he saw because Nebuchadnezzar had them gouge out his eyes. 
and blind, he was taken away into exile. All prophesied by Jeremiah, all that come true. Terrible prophecy. The thing was, though, Jeremiah got to prophesy not just these negative things, but in our reading, we see him prophesying great and wonderful things that will come after this. The land had to be cleared away because it had become sinful. The people there had built idols and altars everywhere, and it needed to be cleansed. This was the Lord's land, his gift, and they defiled it. So this destruction at the hand of Babylon and Assyria was a cleansing. (coughs) The people being taken away into exile was a cleansing. For those that died, that was punishment. But those that survived, it was discipline. It was to teach them that your gods that you're trusting in can't stop these things from happening. Only the Lord can. And he lovingly kept them safe in Babylon, gave them Ezekiel as a prophet to work to change their hearts and minds away from idol worship and back to the one true God. With the promise that the land would be restored that once again there would be sheep on the hills and cattle and flocks. The cities would be rebuilt. There would be the sound of joy and mirth and exaltation as the people were enjoying the fruits of the land once again planted back in this wonderful land. The sound of the bridegroom and the bride, people getting married. Wonderful messages of hope. Fulfilled. Just like these negative prophecies of Jeremiah they had seen fulfilled, now they could know and hope that these two, 70 years later, these wonderful, wonderful words of restoration of the land and the people to the land would just as assuredly happen. Jeremiah has another prophecy, one that's going to look far beyond the return of the exiles to the land. 600 years later to a fulfillment and a restoration that God would bring. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, which I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. A righteous branch from David Isaiah talks about the shoot from the stump of Jesse. Same thing. Something that was promised to David back when he was king, that one of his descendants would rule on his throne over God's people, and that rule would never end. Jeremiah prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah who would be righteous, always in right standing. Everything that he did was always in agreement with what God wanted done. He fulfilled God's will and plan perfectly. Not just in what he did with his hands, but what he said with his mouth and what he thought with his mind and his heart. 600 years later, this righteous branch sprung up in Bethlehem, in a manger, in the birth of Jesus Christ. That's the restoration that Jeremiah gets to prophesy. And it's the cause of a greater restoration. Sure, God at the time of the exiles restored the people to the land and the beauty of the land, but they needed their hearts and their souls restored. And that happened partially as they started back up the sacrificial system, but those sacrifices look forward to the coming of this, this child, this righteous branch. Because we, on our own, just as they, can't be righteous. What we say, do, and think is is contrary to what God wants. But this child came to live a perfect life, and in baptism gives that to you as your gift. He is the righteous branch, always doing what was right in the eyes of God, and through faith gives that to you. So you have credit for all of his perfect words, actions, and thoughts. Child that would execute justice. 
Justice says that for sin there must be punishment. Sin there must be death. Except this child didn't come to kill all of us. He came to take our place. To put himself on the cross. To serve God's justice for our sin upon himself. To take our sin and make it his own. And die to to forgive it forever. The righteous branch, in his death and resurrection, makes you righteous. Gives you credit for his right standing and takes from you all that would keep you out of God's presence. All of your sin. Bought and paid for by him. Something that he began when he died and rose again. Something that was given to you in your baptism. Something that keeps being worked in you by the Lord. Every time you remember your baptism, every time you confess your sins, every time you hold fast to that promise of what Jesus' death and resurrection means from you, you are being redeemed and cleansed over and over, even as you sin, because God's grace and mercy overrules and is far greater than your sin. Keeping you in relationship with him now and for eternity to come. What a wonderful prophecy. What a wonderful thing for us to look forward to, not in our lives now, but what it means for what is to come. So now let's look at these words from our gospel lesson through the eyes of faith. Now when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Sure, these things are scary. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when the powers of the heavens are shaken, when the earth, sun, and moon, and stars aren't staying where they're supposed to be, when there's a tumult of the sea, when the sky is rolling up like a stroll, when everything is disappearing. But know this. Through the eyes of faith, you're going to see the Son of Man coming in all his glory, and you know exactly who he is. He is your Lord and Savior, the King of the universe, the one that went to the cross to die to forgive you, that has given you his right standing, has kept you in that faith, and now he's come to gather you unto himself and to take you home. All of these bad signs look forward to the greatest restoration and redemption that will ever, ever be. Because when he returns... Your bodies will be raised from the dead, made perfect, perfectly restored to what they should have been, the perfection of the original creation. And not just your bodies. Through the work of Christ, he will finish that work begun in your baptism. Your souls completely restored and cleansed. No longer will you have that sinful heart that fights against God's will. That'll be gone. You will live in perfect unity with God and with one another, knowing exactly what he wants you to do and being able to do it. That's the redemption that's drawing near. That's the thing we look forward to. That's the thing that's greater than all of the scary things that are coming up. And the Holy Spirit is working in you now to keep you steadfast in that faith so when that day comes, it doesn't spring upon you like a trap, but you welcome it. And welcome our Savior with open and loving arms. So, sing with me. It's... And I know... Oh, please, stop. (laughs) The signs of Christmas are still kind of a drag. I don't like the snow. I don't like the slipperiness. I don't like the fact that my wallet is shrinking and my waistline is getting bigger. I don't look forward to the malls and all that, but you know what? I do look forward to gathering with loved ones on that day. And I pray that you have loved ones to gather with too. These negative signs and all the things that lead up to Christmas, even though they're a pain, when the actual day comes, make it that much better. Same thing with the signs that are coming on the last day. We're seeing them now. We're seeing signs of trouble in the earth. We know that things are going to happen that are going to be beyond our ability to comprehend. But we look forward to what they all point to. Jesus' return and the restoration of all things to a perfection we have never seen or known. Both the world, the new heaven and the new earth, return to the Garden of Eden. 
and in us. A return to that perfect relationship with one another and God. And it'll last for eternity. So we can stand up straight and hold up our heads. And we can say with joyful expectation, Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.